The answer is tabs, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Just starting right off with it. Yeah, all right. <laughs> all right, so uh, I thought we'd start with an easy question. Is JavaScript gonna be boring in 2020? <laughs> Do you think this is boring? This is awesome, right? <laughs> exactly. No. Well, I, you know, this is a question that I was thinking about. I think JavaScript and Node.js has become boring in a way that's actually all right. Mm -hmm. You know, that it's so well established that it's becoming something that you just expect. I was talking about this earlier in the week, and I'll try out my analogy. I'm not sure if it'll work. But you know, we all turn on the water in our, you know, our bathrooms or our kitchens all the time, right? We don't even think about it. But just think, in those days when those pipes were brand new, like in 100 years ago, whenever it was, and you're like, oh my gosh, look at that. But it was marvelous. But over time, it just became boring, and we just expect it. Now there will be the occasional issues with rust or pollution or whatever it might be. But hey, that's, that's, that's the life of code too, right? For yeah. me, uh, boring is a sign of success, right? You know, you look at Linux, it's used everywhere, that's, and it's kind of boring. No, no one really goes to a Linux conference uh, anymore, but it's used everywhere. So it's, to me, it's just a sign of success. No one goes to a Linux conference? Yeah, like, I go. Have you been to Linux Con? <laughs> Linux Con is not even a thing. <laughs> yes, it's no longer. Well, I don't think it's boring at all. Like, there's a lot of events and conferences and new libraries and packages all the time happening. So I don't think JavaScript is boring. I don't think it's going to get boring anytime soon. I mean, yes, it becomes a stable, but no boring. Like, stable is not a synonym of boring. But, right? but water's not boring. Water is, <laughs> you can do all kinds of things with water. It's just like you can do all kinds of things with JavaScript. So. It, I, the, underlying, I, the underlying JavaScript in Node.js is there, and that's a good thing. It should be boring. Uh, yeah. me, as someone from outside the JavaScript community, as more of an infrastructure uh, person, I sometimes get entertained, at least, by what goes on in the JavaScript community. When the whole left, left pad thing happened, I'm like, all right, JavaScript, cool. How's that, how's that going for you? So from an external perspective, it's, uh, it's a little bit interesting and, and exciting. But yeah. you know, from a stability, maturity point of view, it's just a widely used technology. Of course, it's going to be a little bit more boring than some new programming language uh, out there. Yeah, and, and we kind of started like from the bottom with JavaScript, right? It was developed in 10 days and uh, <laughs> not developed for the world that we live in now, really. Um, but it has evolved over time, and it's getting much better, and it's getting, I mean, it has gotten so much better. Uh, but the language itself just provides so much more, and I think that that might be where, uh, you know, some of the drama came in with, like, left pad. You know, we have, we have pad start now and pad end. Like, there's, the, the language itself provides you with so much that you don't really have to rely on third-party tools to do that. Sure. And so maybe that is an indicator that it's, it's starting to get boring. But there is drama from the start. <laughs> there was all kinds of drama, you know? I mean, there was like, you know, you had Netscape, you had Sun, you had Microsoft, you had Brendan going on vacation and coming back and the world changed. I mean, it, it, was, a, it was a totally different time. And, but one of the things I find interesting is like in conversations with people, especially here over the past few days, is there's still an existential crisis though going on, right? There's this, there's this fear that, oh my gosh, you know, we have something so good, we can't ruin it. I thought Miles' discussion on that in his, in his keynote the other day really, really hit upon it, that there are lots of, lots of, lots of still present fears that are re very real. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and kind of tying into that, um, do you think that, uh, like, frameworks, do you think the framework wars are coming to a close? Like, are they starting to get more, uh, more stable, in, in, at least in terms of what, we're using day to day. It's a good question. I mean, you know, the, it, JavaScript tends to be a community where people like to write little packages, and you know, there's lots of solutions out there. There's definitely a bit of, um, you know, uh, I don't, like monoculture, maybe right the word, where like there's frameworks that React and Angular are probably some of the most widely. Uh, you know, use ones, use ones. Even jQuery is still, you know, running the internet. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, un unfortunately, uh, or fortunately. Um, you know, uh, things tend to coalesce in a solution, you know, over time. We've seen this in other programming languages where some stuff just eventually gets baked into the language itself over time or there becomes just a standard library. I don't think that's necessarily a, a, a bad thing, but, um, you know, there is definitely some gravitation towards, you know, a, a standard set of, of tools for folks. 
I don't think the frameworks are in a war. They're not like, oh, let's go to battle. I mean, no. <laughs> I mean, for me, it's more like a healthy competition of frameworks and tools. Like, there is different frameworks because there are different needs. So it's mm -hmm. not like a war. Like, so, yeah, I don't think there's a word there. It, yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it definitely seems like a lot of the popular frameworks are uh, kind of coalescing around the same set of ideas, things like virtual DOM and uh, maybe JSX usage or things like that. Uh, there's a lot of, of coalescing into that. Uh, do you see that as being a good thing or is that kind of stifling innovation? You always want to enable competition, but at least from like you know from an end user perspective, you know I'm a you know C C plus plus JVM person, and sometimes I write basic JavaScript apps, and I'm like, what the hell do I need like need to use now? It's like what the hell is Vue.js, right? Like where'd this come from, right? So it does make it I think a little bit confusing from you know a newcomer end user perspective when you have all these options, but the competition is good to kind of ensure innovation will will, will constantly uh, happen. Yeah. So it's a trade off. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned, uh, yeah, yeah. So they are kind of coalescing around around those ideas. And do you think that that is helping us to to kind of hone that sword and, and make that the best the best possible way forward? When when I talk to developers here, they they, they say there's just different needs, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, React has been been you know popular. I think in some respects with larger organizations, you know, and, 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 and people who are in smaller shops may have more freedoms to, and really different needs and demands. And so that seems to me like, again, to what you're saying, is like there are different requirements and there's different issues. I mean, what do you, what do you see people using these days? Well, definitely Node. Node. It's actually, I was watching the Stack Overflow survey and Node is one of the most widely used, well, yeah, it's not a framework, it's a runtime, but still it's very used. And in, after that, React, and then Angular and Vue, there's also, I mean, in front end, like React, Angular, and Vue are definitely the top three frameworks into battle, but it's more like a competition. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's what I see. You know, as long as stuff gets like eventually baked into the language over time or something thrown in TC39, you know, a lot of the, like the stuff that jQuery, you know, originally pioneered kind of made itself, uh, you know, baked in the language over time. As long as that competition happens, I think it's, 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 it's great for the community. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think that, um, yeah, as you mentioned, there's like 60% of developers are using React. Um, do you think that that number continues to rise in 2020? Well, I think React grew as much as it could. Like, I don't think there is going to be a massive growth, like it doubled the users. I don't think that's possible, but I think it's going to grow like a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And if a new framework comes, that, we, that kind of affects the ecosystem. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, but yeah, I don't think it's going to grow like massively. I yeah. think it's going to more like stagnate and yeah. I'm sure there will always be a, a Zion for those of us who reject the matrix. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, kind of speaking of that, and you, you kind of mentioned the idea of like a monoculture yeah. uh, possibly forming. Uh, another widely, wildly used tool is uh, TypeScript. And so that also has kind of 60% of developers using that according to uh, the Stack Overflow. And it's also the, third, the seventh most popular language, uh, but the third <laughs> most interesting language for developers. Um, do you see those numbers changing at all in 2020? Or do you see more developers seeing the light of of a statically typed language? I, I'm definitely on team static, statically typed, but that's just my <laughs> preference. I don't, I don't know. I, I was born in a different time. <laughs> but I know, uh, you, know uh, you know, languages like JavaScript and, and Ruby were popular for, for, for many reasons. But I, I would love to, your opinion. No, I Liz. actually <laughs> see TypeScript growing a lot. Like, I think is, that is going to grow a lot in this year. Yeah. yeah. It's much easier to build tools when you have statically typed languages, yeah. in my opinion. So. It just, uh, I, it, has there been that much movement, do you think, in the, in the community over the past year and changes in TypeScript overall versus other languages? It doesn't seem like that, that trend's gonna change at all. It doesn't seem like there's anything in the wind unless I'm missing something. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. There's, there's lots of things that could change that, I'm sure. Um, but, yeah, there's, I'm not sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
But do you, do you see that kind of leading towards a rise of like a, a monoculture of tooling that we have? Yeah. Okay, so for example, in monoculture tooling, I see the developers use like always the same tool. For example, VS Code. Mm -hmm. They're most of them, I mean, most of JavaScript developers use VS Code for other la languages. They have other toolings, but for Scala and Python, and they use other text editors. For JavaScript developers, I see most of them using VS Code, and I think it's good. Like, VS Code is a great tool, mm -hmm. and if it works, and as long as it's free and open source, I think it's good. I don't care if Microsoft owns it. It's, it's number one on, in the Octoverse study. Yeah, it's number one. Yeah, I mean, as, as someone who's been involved for open source over 20 years, it's a little bit, uh, a, a little bit terrifying of kind of what's going on in some ways, because I spent probably 10 years of my uh, career, uh, you know, battling, you know, the evil empire at the time, which was Microsoft, uh, <laughs> working on, um, if you heard of Eclipse, you, if anyone used Eclipse again, sorry, that was partially my uh, fault back in the day. Um, but. Uh, you know, uh, you know. Eventually, what uh, what happened was people. What did you do to Eclipse, Chris? I read. <laughs> no, you know, I mean, if you were a Java developer back and then, you probably used it. But I used to write all the plugin tooling, all the Git and SEM tooling. But that was, those are that was another age. But the reason Eclipse was formed is because there was a bit of a uh, monoculture of tooling at that time. One company owned the majority of, of tools and the developer documentation and all that stuff, and people were uncomfortable. There's no way to customize it. It wasn't open source, uh, and so this huge community came around Eclipse and, you know, for, for someone who, who lived through those battles, seeing that, you know, you have VS Code, uh, you know, GitHub, uh, <laughs> TypeScript, you know, all owned again by, by one company is a little bit terrifying. You know, I think Microsoft's been a great uh, steward, but I think it's something, you know, uh, us as developers need to keep these, like, you know, organizations in, in, in check, essentially, and make sure that what they're doing is actually good overall for uh, for everyone, but something that keeps me up at night, um, at least. But you know, I've I've worked with folks that are like, oh yeah, Microsoft's great. Like you know, they're amazing. I'm like, I guess now, but like, <laughs> there's some of us have a different uh, context from, from mean, back in the day. The culture of Microsoft has changed a lot. Like it has a very better reputation than a few years back. So they're awesome. Like they've contributed <laughs> a lot. I'm I'm super stoked. Yeah. But there's always something that you know is the back of my shoulder that you know let's not let's not make this happen again. Let's, so Google. Uh, is, so Google is Google's, in comparison. I think Google's great. They contribute <laughs> back. I've mentored tons of folks on Summer of Code. It's it, it's a different different history. Google has always kind of been fairly open uh, over time. But um, you know it's something to, to think about because at the end of the day, like having having competition with different types of developer tools is good. It, it, it helps improve things and, and so on. So if we, if we lose that, uh, you know, uh, we just have to be careful. I think we need to ensure that there's enough competition out there. You know, mm -hmm. there's always, you know, your old Vim Emacs kind of diehard, you know, they have Vim, Team Vim. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, we, we just need to ensure we need to have a healthy competitive ecosystem um, out there that's fair, fair and neutral in my opinion. Absolutely, but with the popularity of something like VS Code, and, and uh, I just learned today, or well, yesterday, yeah. at this conference, though, uh, about how you know they can package up a full dev environment, and you can just connect with your browser and have yeah. everything Linux running right there. The VS Code Remote or whatever. That's, yeah, that's VS a cool Code feature. Online. Yeah, 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 yeah. Super swing. It, how, how do you, <laughs> how do others compete with that kind of infrastructure? Well, it's interesting. Is like back in the uh, back in like the Eclipse days, the whole idea is we wanted to make tooling free and available. You wouldn't have to pay for you know Code Warrior. Like back in the, it was terrible. You had to pay for tools back then. <laughs> terrible life. Uh, and, and so everything was open. Now, what's interesting is like with the trend of kind of having this you know VS Code online or other stuff online. Now it's like, hmm, you know, is this a op potential opportunity to like? charge for certain things now. It's like, oh, you want to have like some fancy, you know, linting, you know, that will be five dollars per, you know, a million lines or something ridiculous. I don't know. It just, you know, as, a, as an old developer tooling person, a little bit, ter it terrifies me that sometimes this stuff will become only SaaS based and locked again. But yeah. if, if, but if the, if the core code, like VS Code is fully open, then, then maybe we're, we're, we're okay. So, yeah. And Microsoft's on, on the good team now. So, so. So we're good. <laughs> I am not like super concerned about monoculture because at the end, I think developers wants to use something that gives them value, mm -hmm. and VS Code gives a lot of value. Mm -hmm. So it's like I don't, I don't really see a problem. There is like a monoculture there. Of course, competition is healthy, and if something better comes in, great. But if not, like it's fine. Like the monoculture is okay. I don't. 
So as long as it, as long as it's useful, right? Yeah, like, as long as it's useful, as long as it works, and yeah. as long as they're it's benevolent with and, it, yeah. and it's open, yeah. Well, what does that do to the other ones out there who are vying for a place? Then, I mean, you know, how, how are you? I'm curious on how you're seeing that competition emerge. It, can that competition emerge at all? Then, if, if you just accept that monoculture? I mean, yeah. yeah. Just depends. Let's just put it that way. So we'll see if you know, like GitHub starts getting these like interesting, like ooh, open in VS Code online type features. But uh, <laughs> but we'll uh, we'll see. And I think developers in general, like tools, are kind of religion. They love you know things, and everyone will have their particular um, you know nuances. I know folks that you still can't rip like Emacs you know out of them, um, even though there's much better options these days. But that's just the way uh, certain yep. folks certain folks are. <laughs> Um, so kind of talking about that and leading into that, um, as, as those types of things like serverless and cloud uh, infrastructure start yeah. um, becoming more mainstream, becoming more what we do every day, um, how do you see the roles of developers changing? It seems like with, with uh, the ability to no longer have like this monolith code base that you know, is in a particular framework or language, you can use the right tool for the right job, um, but what kind of changes does that cause for the, the developer, uh, maybe like as far down as the front end developer? Do they have to, to worry about this as they go? Anything that lowers the barrier for people to contribute and develop something of use to them, I think is, is great. Um, I, I just don't want to be in a position where, you know, you know I, I grew up in an environment where you could tinker with computers and, you know, learn, you know, how everything works when you kind of get this environment where, like, a lot of serverless things, like, you know, I just need to go write a couple functions, tie some events, and it just, like, magically auto-scales. I don't have to, like, understand how any of that actually works. I mean, that's a great thing, but, you know, part of learning is to actually tinker and be able to kind of understand behind the scenes of, of you know, of, of how things work, but... Well, you uh, certainly have to tinker with Kubernetes. Yeah, that's, 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 my, that's my project these days. But, uh, but, but I mean, I get, you know, the, the analogy people use is like, you know, you know, tons of people drive cars every day. No one really knows, you know, how a, you know, a car works, you know, un, under the hood. So I'm like, yeah, fair enough. Maybe this, that will happen for, you know, the future of apps, you know, for the next decade. We'll move to more of a serverless uh, model. And if that brings a whole new generation of developers, awesome. I think, I think it's great. We need more software developers out there. So I have a question for the for for the crowd. How many how many here are interested in Kubernetes? <laughs> it's a different audience for me. How many use Kubernetes? Oh, that's great! Wow, I saw See? different hands between interested and using. Wow. <laughs> well, I'm, I have an, I have another question then. Is this for a career interest or just is this for a career interest or for work? Do your apps run on Kubernetes? Well, well. So that's like. I don't know, 20%, maybe 15. Because I was getting feedback from, the, from, from people who I was talking to who were just saying, well, you know, I, the company's starting to use Kubernetes, so I think I need to start like, looking into it. And, you know, and, and they kind of like, seemed a little bit hesitant about it, but the crowd here, their reaction a little bit different. And I mean, I, well, one thing that would really, I think is really would be exciting to see is more people who are in the JavaScript and the Node community be in the Kubernetes community because there's that 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 whole issue around developer happiness is it, it's it's it is present. But, you know, at, at the end of the day, it's like you know how many people in the Node and JavaScript communities know like how the kernel fully works, right? Probably not not many. I, I guess I don't think you need to know the full you know internals. Kubernetes is a little bit different in a way where you know at the end of the day, if you're writing a distributed application in your services, you're gonna have to understand a, a little bit. But I don't think you need to understand the full, you know, under the hood, how, how everything fully works, but. Well, maybe not how it fully works, but at least be involved to help, yeah, it, you know, improve, sure. the, improve the improving the develop, happiness. Improving developer experience is always a, always a fun topic. So, um, you know, it's a tool that was originally built by infrastructure, you know, engineers. I mean, the kernel's not necessarily user-friendly. Um, no. You know, uh, uh, anyway, so. Um, yeah, but bringing in those uh, different, like more diverse thoughts, absolutely, definitely help. I'm curious, then, what does the Node and JavaScript community need to make it more diverse and happy? Is there any viewpoint on that? I mean, how, do, do you see anything in particular from you know when you talk to people about 
or when you look at out across the community, what would be, what would bring, what would make the community richer in terms of its participation? Or do you think it's pretty far ahead of other communities from what you've seen? Well, I mean, you can just see it right here. It's not like a very diverse community. Like, I, I just want to see, like, how many women are here? Like, oh, identify as a woman. You see, like, there is very little. Like, so I think a lot of work has to be done into the more diversity and more community because it's proof. This has, like, scientific studies that shows that when a more diverse the team is more diverse, it has like better results in every sense. Mm -hmm. So I think diversity is very, very important. And also, for example, I saw a video like a couple of months ago that really impacted me. It was just like a, a simple mm, soap dispenser. So you put the hands and it gives you soap. Soap, right? And so it only worked for white people. If a black person put the hand, like the soap couldn't read that it was a person there, so it wouldn't give them soap. So that's why like diversity it's so important. Like for me, like the people that are creating software, that are creating technology, are creating the future. And we need a future that is more diverse for everybody. So we have like a better world, right? So so yeah, I think we definitely we need more diverse communities and more diverse events and Absolutely. Yeah. 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 The people creating the tools are creating the tools for them. That yeah, exactly. Them. And so we need a more diverse uh, outlook, a more diverse uh, mindset that goes into that to make sure that it accounts for everyone and not just the people de uh, developing it. Yeah. yeah, definitely. That's across, I think, a, 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 ton of, a ton of factors, geos, gender, you know, et cetera. One thing that kind of was interesting for me reading the, uh, the Stack Overflow server, survey report where I think it was the majority of, of people, according to that report, were, were, had uh, less than I think three year or three to five years ex like mm -hmm. as it as a developer so just also making sure you're you know inclusive for for people that are for, for new to the craft you know a lot of people are learning on their own and all this stuff and so trying to make sure the communities are inclusive to the folks that are just starting their journey absolutely what are some action actionable things that we can do in 2020 to make that easier for new developers and more diverse developers to get in well, I know it's par partly our responsibility, in, you know, in the media to, to be a part of that. I, I really believe it. I, mm -hmm. I think that part of our role is not to, is to like talk to people from various backgrounds and really get their, get their perspectives on application development or, or application management, right? Mm -hmm. um, or how you're building architectures and just trying to reach as many people as we possibly can who are representative of the of larger society because underrepresented minorities are 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 are, are sorely looked over uh, from our point of view. Yeah, for me, like a lot of there's a lot of things that to be done. For example, you can mentor somebody else from mm -hmm. uh, underrepresented. You can also do donate money. Uh, also, one of the things that I'm from Colombia, and one of the things that has worked a lot is just leaders creating meetups or conferences and also like giving all these opportunities to people that cannot like access to them. So so yeah, there's a lot of things to be done. I guess I actually was seeing the GitHub survey and it was really impressive that the open source community is growing a lot in Nigeria. I was like, wow, that's very interesting. And also like in South America. So I think there's a lot of talent out there. It's just they don't have like the environment and the resource to give back and to create awesome things. Yeah. So it, it seems like at least, you know, we, we cover the, the, the cloud native community pretty closely and and there's a very small it's it's a very small community of underrepresented minorities and, but there's a very core strong group of people who are very, very close and very, you know, supportive of each other. And it's that mentorship and that, you know, and that those peers that seem to be so important for those communities, for the communities to really, you know, build upon that. Yeah, I think yeah. it just ha it has to be part of your values. And, you know, for, I also help run developer relations at the Linux Foundation. And something we do for all of our events is, you know, have, you know, diversity, you know, scholarships on every single, um, you know, event we do, uh, lunches, networks, anything to kind of help connect people. Um, you know, I hope more conferences, you know, continue to do that type of work. Uh, also meeting people where they are. So, you know, doing events that maybe a new 
uh, geos and, and stuff like that, so people could travel. You know, sometimes, um, you know, we uh, we, we held um, uh, KubeCon recently a uh, couple couple weeks, two three weeks ago, and we were running to people that could had like visa issues coming into the, uh, the U.S. because. You know, God forbid we can't run a country anymore, but you know, it's it, it, it's it's just a tough situation. Another so existential go, crisis. Yeah, existential crisis. So like, you know, like doing events in you know regions where it's easier for people potentially to get to yeah. or or closer to 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 where they are. Yeah, definitely, and I definitely think it's it's good to have um, like like you want to see yourself in your role models, and so having that diverse set of role models is is really yeah. important. I was also reading a book recently about how um, like. One way to, or a big way to address this is uh, through having, having role models when you're young about, and, and you know, really encouraging that when you're young uh, and seeing people who look like you and having them as role models. And I think one really great way that we saw at this conference was uh, Ellie Galloway. Oh, Ellie yeah, Galloway, she was, she was great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she was fantastic. She really, uh, she really, I, I think, lit up the stage in just yeah. a way that she also lit up her software, which is fascinating mm -hmm. too. Just the, that whole kind of new age of it, jewel bots and IoT. And it gives me a little bit more faith in humanity. Yeah. Uh, For sure. at, at least because at that age, I just was doing stupid stuff. So, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm for that, but I was thinking about her and she comes from a good environment and has supporting parents and all of this, but what happened with the kids that don't have yeah. that, right? right. Yeah, exactly. Like, so that's why the community comes in. Like people, for example, I, I have in the community I'm from, mm -hmm. uh, we volunteer to high schools. We go there. Like a lot of community leaders actually come from high schools that people were teaching each other. So, so yeah, I think Ellie is a great example. It's awesome. I, I hope to see more kids and more girls involved. I think it's also the people in this room, right? You know, every every person who's sitting in this room right now, after 5 p.m. on a Thursday <laughs> evening in Montreal, yeah. Canada, pro many far, far from home, are very passionate about their work. I mean, and they can just, and that that's just always going to be shared. And mm -hmm. yeah. I think it's just the more opportunities to share that passion, yeah. you know, and share that dedication. I think actually can be very self-fulfilling too. Yeah. So what are some things that we can do in our work, in our open source work, in our local communities to, uh, th that are actionable, that, that can push this message forward in 2020? It's so many things. I mean, you know, um, I'm sure all of us know that in our communities with local meetups, mm -hmm. um, you know, supporting the groups um, that are really supporting underrepresented minorities. Uh, Girls Who Code has a very strong chapter in Portland. Um, there's, I think there's also ways to reach into to, to the schools. Um, you, know, uh, f you know, for instance, I mean, I come from a you know, background in journalism, so there's plenty of opportunities for, for me to go out there and, you know, and talk to people about the work that I do. I think that's so just so very true for developers. Yeah, I think companies must be involved as well. Like they, mm -hmm. they have the resource to make more diverse communities and to, yeah, because one of the biggest struggles, especially for a third world countries and is money, right? right? So companies should be able to give more and yeah, I think companies should work. Absolutely. And also like people in general, just like volunteering, mentoring, uh, just giving workshops, the meetups is the, a big thing. So yeah, yeah, there's lots of, of ways to, to yeah, donate, uh, including time uh, yeah. and resources like money and food and things like that. Yeah, I spend, I run a local Kubernetes meetup, mentoring, I've helped people sometimes land, uh, you know, internships that they may not have, you know, the connection, because, you know, that, you know, I think, you know, there's tons of developers out there, but like opportunity is not something that's necessarily, you know, equally spread, you know, to everyone. So just making that connection, you know, for someone uh, definitely, definitely helps. Absolutely. Very cool. So there's one other subject that I uh, wanted to transition into before our time is up, mm -hmm. uh, and that is security. Um, what do you think? You think there will be some kind of huge hack or vulnerability disclosed in 2020? Freaking <laughs> terrifies me, like, every day. I don't know how many people follow, um, there's an account called Internet of Shit on Twitter. Yes. It's one of the best ones, right? And so it's just like, 
every day it's just like, why do we need like something that like makes cookies, you know, have, need to have like an IP so it could like SMS me when the cookies um, are done or like, uh, uh, it recently it was like a toilet needs a firmware update and you're like, why does the toilet need, uh, you know, so, so what's crazy is like you're having, you know, software is pervasive, it's all around us now in, you know, toothbrushes, fridges, TVs. The thing that terrifies me is, um, you know, uh, let's say non-traditional tech companies may not be the best tech savvy folks, so they may not like update their dependencies as much. Uh, even developers in the crowd, like, uh, you know, how many people here like, uh, when they publish to NPM, like how many of you people like sign your packages and also have 2FA enabled on your account? I don't think it's everyone in this in, in this room. There's one. Oh yeah, we There's probably, one. Yeah. <laughs> Woohoo! We got one. Is there yes. another one in the house? <laughs> So it just, just well, like, yeah, there's thank two you. over thank there. You. So just, like, just in general, having like good security practices that are not only followed by open source developers or companies. So, so this is something that definitely keeps me uh, awake at night because software is just going to end up in more and more things from like cars and, you know, I now have like one of those fancy little electric thermostats at home. Like what happens <laughs> if, you know, someone hacks it and messes with the temperature and drives me <laughs> crazy? So it's like, it, it does, I think security is, is a global, thing that we have to all work together on and improve and, and it's and it cuts across communities. It's not only, you know, the, the Node or OpenJS community, you know, we have it in Kubernetes land. We we recently sponsored a bunch of security audits for our communities. I would love if it's something that OpenJS could do to kind of fund these things. But it, it, it's it's it, it's something terrifying, but the opportunity I think as uh, a bunch of communities come together and improve things is 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 awesome at least. Yeah, I was just actually <laughs> I was just looking at uh from the SNCC presentation today. Did anyone go to the SNCC presentation today? Was it revealing to you? Yeah, super <laughs> revealing. And like the new vulnerabilities each year by, each year by ecosystem, it's, you know, NPM has just gone whoop. <laughs> and, you know, but it's true too for across open source. I mean, you, you see this across the community. Yeah. It's a software supply chain issue. Right? It, yeah, it's, it's such a multifaceted problem because there, there's just no one solution, right? Like it could be bad dependencies, it could be maintainers that disappear, like all, all this stuff happens. It's really like a cultural change that you have to do to kind of uh, get things and it's something we should all work uh, together across are, communities. Are you seeing, I mean, are you seeing developers, I mean, in your colleagues who you talk to, are they caring more about security? Oh, at all? yeah, all the time. Okay. It's a big thing. All right. Yeah. All right. I'm happy to hear that. Good to hear. It's like, yeah, especially like the people that work on security, like they're super paranoid with everything. They're paranoid. I, I have seen that. They're, you, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. paranoia, you know, that can work, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I don't work in security, so I'm like super relaxed. I'm like, but. <laughs> maybe. So, maybe but, yeah. Uh, Sorry, I was, like, I was like, maybe we should have like, we usually have like meetups to like learn about like new languages. Maybe it's like, let's just do like a, a meetup to like, hey, everyone turn on 2FA please or something like yeah. just to like <laughs> teach people the benefits. But yeah. I, I don't know, something needs to be done. It it's definitely keeps, keeps me up. Enough. Well, this is the existential crisis of, I think this is the 2020 existential crisis. And actually, I, this is the biggest threat, I think, to the Node and JavaScript community. And I think, you know, it's, it's, it's security it's, it, bar none. And it's not just it, Node, it's not just JavaScript, but no. we're here yeah. in Node.js conf. And so yeah. I'm like, you know, that, that's it. At, at KubeCon, I met uh, an automotive manufacturer that's like, oh yeah, we're gonna put like Kubernetes in the car. I'm like, why would you do that? Like, <laughs> but it's like, but people will do that to, to like, you know, I'm sure- Hey, Node, it's in Chick-fil-A now. I'm, I'm, I'm sure Node ships. is in all like, yeah. Node's probably in some car. It's probably like in Tesla. It's in all space. Your, yeah, it's, yeah, in space, that's, that's also terrifying. <laughs> so, that's, 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 which version? <laughs> so, <laughs> well, yeah, that, uh, you know, that, that is a big thing, I think, to watch out for in 2020 is, is security. It's the first CVE in space, someone's going to get that, and that's going to be quite awesome. But, yeah, it's, <laughs> oh, I think there was one. I think they did have a CVE in space. Oh, okay, it's okay. Oh, no, 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 there was a... Uh, okay. No, it's not. First I'm person thinking, hacks something, something in space. I think there was actually a it's gonna be person good. charged with a crime in space, but you know, CVs are to come. Right? Well, I want to thank you all. Um, we have run out of time. Uh, they say to usually end these things on a high note, but instead we're ending it on paranoia. <laughs> <laughs> we're all doomed. <laughs> thank you so much. Cool. Thank, thank you. you.